Welcome back. We are in the second segment. And here we have with us um, Mrs. Uzo Uzoma. She's a senior program coordinator, Christian Aid International. You're welcome, Ma. Thank you. Okay, so we'll go straight away. Ma, we've heard of this uh, ECID. So what's this ECID program all about? Okay, um, that's the acronym for Evidence and Collaboration for Inclusive uh, Development. So it's actually a project we are um, taking off in Alhambra and it's being piloted in three countries. It's a multi-country project. So we are looking at Nigeria, Myanmar, and Zimbabwe. And the um, essence is actually to improve assets, especially for mar marginalized groups. And part that's partly why we are here today, because um, the marginalized groups we are looking at it includes adolescent women, adolescent girls, um, then rural women, and then people with disabilities. Thank you. Based on the evidence this program has gathered, what are the identified uh, barriers or um, challenges that the adolescents in these rural areas face? Okay, um, we carried out in February 2020, we did some, a baseline study. And um, what we found out that, we found out that there are a lot of challenges, um, especially in some of these rural areas. Yes, the government has done a lot, especially in Anambra State. Anambra has been rated high when it comes to education. We have more um, people in school, especially girls. And um, though we've also found out that we have a lot of boys who are out of school, and then the enrollment actually decreases after the primary, after primary school. Then in most of the rural um, communities where we work, we found out that we have a problem of access. There are many communities that don't have secondary schools, like in Omasi. Omasi, you know, they don't have a secondary school in um, Urumbanasa. So in places like that, in Anambra, we are working in four local governments. So we have Anambra West, Oka North, we have Obai, Obaru, and Daya Melum. So in most of these communities, because most of them are remote, we have challenges. And the problem again we have is that of um, the distance. So like in Omasi, after primary school, most of them, most, especially the girls, they don't go back to school. Parents wouldn't want to take their, um, wouldn't allow the, uh, the children, especially the girl child, to go to very distant places because they have to get like an accommodation for them to stay. And then you know how it is when you leave children with no supervision. So that speeds, and then we also have issues around the dilapidated buildings. We have issues around personnel, teachers not coming to school, and stuff like that. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, but you talked about access. So what are some of the consequences of um, lack of access for some people and the adolescents? What are the consequences? Um, yeah, that's a good one. Um, basically, why are we celebrating the African child? When it started, in 1991, it was because of some of the th um, some young people took to the streets because of the issues they had around education, access to education, and that's some of the challenges we still have today. So, um, in some of those locations, we know that when children don't have access to education, they, when they don't go to schools, we have issues around people. Children can start um, loitering around. Um, they don't, uh, and you know how it is when people don't go to school, when young people are not engaged, the girls can easily be mislead. We have issues of early pregnancy, especially in those riverine areas. And then we also have um, young boys who practically have nothing, and then all they do is roam the streets. And like we all know, an idle, man, um, an idle mind is a devil's workshop, so anything can happen. At the end of the day, these children end up not living up to expectation, not having the kind of dreams they or even their parents had for them. Uh, thank you, ma. Thank you, ma. So, um, talking about uh, early pregnancy and uh, all the social vices that occur, what are the gaps that still exist in government's policies and decisions today? Hmm. Um, yeah, that's a good one. We all know that we have a lot of barriers. And um, in as much as government has tried to do a lot, and they are still doing a lot, and also looking at what just happened. It also raises some concern for me, looking at the fact that the, nation, um, that, um, the budget, national budget was cut for education was cut by half. And education is a critical sector that we should focus on. So the problem for me that I see is that of implementation. We have a lot of good policies. I know we have uh, that which is integrated in the ANITS. We have the state sector operational plan for um, 
set education year for, uh, the, for the state. We have a lot of good plans for the state, but the problem is in implementation. For instance, we have issues around monitoring. We have issues around uh, funding and budgeting, you understand? So who tries to oversee these things, you know? There is need for government to really have a good M&E system in place such that um, they can check what is happening on the field. You know, we we'll have staff who go there to check what, who even check on the personnel, who check on projects that are being implemented, just to ensure that things are being run the way it should be. So these are critical things that should be done. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other group, Ma, apart from the government, that have a role to play in collecting and using evidence? Yeah, um, everybody does. Yeah, uh, in the state, we have the State Bureau of Statistics. They do actually collect this data. We have the ministries, they collect a lot of data. But most times, there is need for a central platform where this data, uh, data can be collated. And then this data should inform planning. This data should inf inform government decisions and budgeting. And that is part of the thing, what, that's part of the thing we want to do in ESAID, where we can facilitate a system where data is being con um, collected centrally and this data is being disaggregated we have specific data for specific groups of people. For instance, we can say um, for, um, for adolescents, for marginalized groups, what, do we have particular data for them? Do we know the number of young girls or the number of PWDs in particular locations? You understand? So it's critical that we have this sort of data and then it's being coordinated centrally and then every, anybody can assess it. For instance, I want some information and I don't even get it. So that is something that, that needs to be done at the state level. And that's something we are looking to partner with the State Bureau of Statistics to do. Thank you. So, um what more can be done by the government and um, what solutions are you proposing to the increased access to services? Okay, um, uh, like you earlier asked, everybody has a role to play in doing this. Parents have a role to play, communities also have a role to play. But if we need to increase this assets, it goes back to that way. For every, any, everybody has a lot to do around it and then um, the MDAs also have a lot to do because they are the ones who generate some of, uh, some of the data and if everybody plays their part well, I believe um, everything we need will be gotten. Okay. Thank you. We're going to go on a short break. We have some video clips to show you. Mama basis is that when the rural areas are developed, the migration from the rural to the urban will be limited and when it is limited we have the, the children those children in the rural areas will be feeling like they belong and they can now stay there and go to school there i, I always urge the government to get the development in the rural areas so that those areas will be developed and the education will go there. Yeah. Government has to come up with a policy how the education should work for everybody. It doesn't matter if you are rich, poor, disabled, or whatever it is. If they come with that policy and the fit. Welcome back. Um, we know that um, we have free education for primary and then to just one. So that is what the law provides. But the thing is this, we have found that um, based on our findings from the field, we have a lot of um, people, communities advocate, uh, agitating that this is not being implemented, that um, they are being asked to pay all sorts of levies, um, a lot of levies are being collected from them. and. There are cases where even children have to be asked to go back to because they cannot aff afford some of these levies yet to have a UBP e policy in place. So these are some of the um, challenges. And again, there are other things that is being uh, done. We have a lot of programs going on in school, in some schools. And then we also have the, um, um, the PTA. So what are they doing? These are people that should take more uh, responsibility. Parents should also take it up as a responsibility to oversee what is happening in their child's school 
um, to check, follow up on some of the programs that is being implemented. And then even when your children complain that they've not been, the teachers have not been coming or they've not been uh, teaching them or stuff like that, parents has that responsibility to ask questions. And that is why we have that constitution in schools so that they can also have meetings with um, the schools and then come up with so solutions to address some of the challenges they have. Okay. Thank you very much, Ma. Uh, are there any special groups or indicators that the government and all stakeholders need to account for in this data collection? Exactly. Thank you for that. You know, there are, because of the way we are constituted, there, is, there are people who need special attention. Just like today we are talking about the African child. And then it tells us that children as well need special attention. So when we are gathering data, we have to give preference to young children. We, you have um, people, whenever we do this kind of um, surveys, you have like studies for under five, you know. And then we also have um, for persons living with disabilities, we also have for adolescents, you know, there are people we should give preference to when we, whenever we are collecting data because the needs of children are different from the needs of adults. They are different from the needs of persons with disabilities. For instance, when we are, um, just like when you're constructing schools, you know, um, you, there are, you have to provide ramps. You understand? Not only in schools, in hospitals, in, def, in different places. So if you don't gather data to know the number of persons, you might take those things for granted. So there are basic things that, basic provisions that should be made for particular kinds of people. If I'm constructing things and I don't take into consideration that this is for children, you know, and I shouldn't leave um, like, like drainages open, children might easily get in or you have a pool or something. There are considerations you have to, and these are the kind of people we are talking about. So that whenever you're the gathering data, whenever you want to make any informed decision, you need to give priority to the needs and the thoughts of those people. Thank you. Ma, you, uh, you know that uh, this African child, the day of the African child, was brought about by the uh, march, protest march by children in Soweto due to the Black Segregation Education Act. But you find out that even till now, there is still that uh, segregation, although it's no longer based on the white and the black, but uh, we have some schools that are known as school of the rich. That's there you get quality and sound education. You find that they have um, a kind of a different uh, curriculum from the, those in the rural areas. So you find out that, although they call it a free basic education, but it's not actually the same. Like in those um, schools for the rich, as I call it, you find out that they kind of have um, ways that the teach children, like things that can better their lives, or like those in the rural areas. So what do we do about this? Thank you. That's a good one. And anyway, I think it's something we have to do a lot of consultation with um, maybe the Ministry of Education. Yeah, I know um, there is a particular curriculum for everybody. And I know most of those schools have them, even the private schools you talk about. Um, but they do have, like some people say, they have the British curriculum. They have um, another one for um, US. And then they also have... Um, Montessori, the way they teach people, Montessori system of education, that is, they use a lot of visuals, audio materials, you know, practical things to, to teach children so that they can assimilate easily. And people have said that it actually works a lot, which is true. But as also that's, that's part of the training given to also teachers in, in, in the um, government sector. But the only difference is that some of those materials are not there. You know, they are not there. And I think it's something... Government, if our system of education, especially for the public schools, is improved, those are some of the requirements, their basic requirements, actually, that should be provided. And it's, um, it's, info it's uh, provided by the policy for, them, for that to happen, you know, using all those old materials and all that. But just that is not being done. And these are part of the things that should be checked. So uh, schools should make effort to provide. I know some of those things are uh, being provided, just like when you say you have a teacher to 25 people, you, you provide a, um, a white chalkboard and all that. These are present provisions, but the thing is who monitors it and who provides such things. That's basically. Okay, yeah. from statistics, we have that uh, most female children, especially in the rural areas, although they, some of them go to schools, but 
when it comes around that December period, most of them stop attending. Because in an interview with one of the teachers, she mentioned that, because we are like, I thought they said that girls don't school, but here they are in, in the classroom. She said, no, don't say that. That is just now, when you come towards the December period, you won't see most of them. Like even most of them don't take their WIAC uh, examination. So, and they're giving out in marriages. So what, sh what do you think should be done to address this issue? Um, yeah, um, that's the rule. We also, like I mentioned earlier, we also found out that that is a challenge, especially in these rural areas where you have a lot of uh, young girls who drop out of school basically to get married. But you won't blame them most times. I, I feel the parents has a lot of um, parts, a role to play in that because these parents are the ones who push them into marriage. Yes, yeah, some of them actually uh, get married, uh, get pregnant, and then they are pushed into marriage. But it's the sole responsibility of the parents, of the mother especially, to advise their children, you know, let them understand that it is, no matter what, it's important for you to have that level of, um, to be educated, because it gives you an age, it empowers you, especially when you get married. Thank you. So, thank you all for watching. This is Good Morning Anambra. And the end of the second segment. But before we end, or rather, towards the ending, I'd like you all to watch an interview. My opinion on general basis is that when the rural areas are developed, the migration from the rural to the urban will be limited. And when it is limited, we have the, the children, those children in the rural areas will be feeling like they belong and they can now stay there and go to school there. I, I always urge the government to get the development in the rural areas so that those areas will be developed and the education will go there. Yeah. Government has to come up with a policy how the education should work for everybody. It doesn't matter if you are rich, poor, disabled or whatever it is. If they come with that policy and they fit that down to the local government, that's the only way. If there is a policy on education, government should ensure that that, that policy is followed. The areas should be given much attention to make sure that their building is normal and adequate like those schools and urban towns. So we've come to the end of today's program on Good Morning Anambra. But before we sign off, I would like to thank you, Mrs. Uzo Uzoma. Thank you very much for bringing our time to be with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you all. Remember, Anambra children, we have rights which must be implemented and protected. Thanks for watching.